Um, today, we're going to be talking a little bit about um, what is going to be a, a part of our month end review, right? We're coming up here to the end of the month. So we're, today, we're going to be actually going through some of the tools that we look to to be able to say, hey, great, what's going to be, uh, what's the review process, right? We had set goals at the very beginning of the month. We had started looking at like what kind of habits, what kind of um, to-do items were we going to have tracking through that week over week uh, from the month end, uh, the month beginning of the month planning um, that we had done in our prior sessions. And uh, what we're going to be doing now in today's session is we're going to be going over a little bit about what do you do for your, your month end review process, right? Or your quarter end review process. What does that look like, right? So the idea here, guys, from 10,000 feet up, so what we're trying to do is be able to get really intentional about what it is that we want, then be able to track down and say, great, what am I doing on a daily and weekly basis to be able to get me what it is I want on a monthly? And then what's my month end review process look like was how successful was I, right? One, did I get to where I wanted to go? And number two, when I look back at all of the things that I did or didn't do, um, what can I learn from that, right? What is the reflection that I learn about how do I operate? You know, did I set out a bunch of goals and only got to 5% of those goals? And if I did do that, how do I feel about that? Or if I set goals that maybe were too easy, right? Which is usually for hard driving type A people like us, right? Where that's usually not the case. We usually are much more overly ambitious of it, but you could find a case that said, hey, well, actually I set goals that were too low. They were too easy for me to hit, right? But one way or the other and reflecting back in on how did the process work whenever I set my intentions from the very beginning of the month, how I was executing through that month, and then how well did that work? Helps you to have a checkpoint to say, how am I gonna improve upon the process of me working, the awareness of me working um, to be able to be a more and more effective person. And this helps guys at every level of the game, right? So this isn't just for uh, people that are starting out. This is processes that um, every successful company, every successful person typically will do uh, because the process here guys is all about continuous improvement, right? It's all about continuous improvement and uh, making small wins consistently uh, over time is the way that we win the game. Um, so Gina, in terms of, I know we're ending a little bit uh, earlier today, guys, I have a show that I need to do. Um, I'll be, well, so we ending about 15 minutes early um, than normal, 15, 20 minutes early. Um, and I'll pass the, uh, the mic over to Gina at that point to be able to uh, help us transition off of that so I can get out a little early to be able to make sure that I'm uh, doing what I need to do to prepare for that show. Um, and uh, what we'll end up doing with that is to um, jump back into uh, what we what things we covered last week and what kind of awarenesses do we have from the last week uh, to this week. So Gina, um, can you tee us up for that for some sharing before we go to the education today? We can, but because it's so, such a shortened period, do we want to do that or just let you jump right in? Oh, let's do a quick one. Let's just do okay. like five minutes and that way we can just keep our rhythm. Okay. Well, last week we talked all about the financial freedom calculator and um, I encouraged us all to complete our own calculator. So for those of you that were on, does anybody have anything they'd like to share in doing that exercise? Anybody complete it? Leah. I actually went back and did the full year in detail, which I haven't done in a couple of years, and I kind of knew it would be painful. Um, I'm not, I'm not terrible on the percentage, the financial freedom percentage. Um, you know, I'm not as far along as as other folks who have been focusing on trying to really bring their passive income up, but the um, passive to net worth was. Atrocious, which as soon as we went over that calculation, I thought to myself, oh my gosh, I know this is going to be really bad. And um, that's something that is definitely my goal for this year is just finding new ways to invest and focusing less on growth, which is, you know, when you're a younger professional, let's say you work with financial services professionals that have, you know, they're, they're managing money for you. It's all about growth and it's never really about income so you to change your whole mindset especially depending on how you were brought up you know I was brought up more with that sort of mentality less of the, like hey you should have rental properties that bring you income so that you're not trading time for money forever um it's, it's a whole shift so um in that process, and I started to write down after after I went through those numbers, I didn't quite do the goals and actual, you know, the goals yet, because let me let me step back for a second and look at the financial investment tools and say to myself, okay, what are a couple of things I want to 
involved in this year or further this year to try to even impose goals. Mm -hmm. So, yep. yep. And I was very happy. Like, it was really great that Chris actually admitted that he, he's doing this frequently, like on a monthly basis, because I felt like, okay, it's not just something crazy that people don't really do. They just talk about and it's in the book and you don't really do it. So I definitely yep. felt encouraged to um, quit now and then keep up with it. I even am teaching my 19 year old how to handle, you know, computing his net worth and his income and all that. Yeah, that's awesome. Those are great insights, Leah. And um, I just want to encourage all of us, um, if, if some of us like Leah had that uh, same reaction that, oh my gosh, this isn't great. I think it was going to be terrible. It is like the change can only start from being aware, right? And so now we're aware and that's how we move forward. So uh, good job, Leah, for listening to the call and uh, filling that calculator out. Chris, I know you have something to share. Okay, we can't hear you. We can't, oh, Chris, hear you. Oh, can't hear you. You came off mute, but we can't hear you. So, mm -mm. <laughs> no, I know you have something really amazing to share too. I'm sure. No, nothing yet. Uh, maybe try like leaving and come back in or something. Yeah, maybe. There's like actually the microphone in the bottom left hand corner as well too. Sometimes. Oh yeah. Different mic. Your audio. Yep. Hey, to it. Um, Leah, I was, I was wondering what Chris has figured that out. I was wondering in that process, like what was the biggest like aha moment from you that you had, um, that you had picked up? That's had, like, if you were going to go to a friend and you say, Hey, listen, this is a, an absolutely painful exercise to do, but I had insert blank epiphany from having done it. Um, that has changed the way that I'm operating moving forward. And my awareness of the way I'm operating moving forward. Is there something in there that would be clear for you to share with your friend that you wanted to share the experience with? A hundred percent. It's that how are you utilizing your assets? Are your assets providing you any return? Um, and that you really have to make sure you're you're thinking in that. You know, it's, there's a there's a line also. Like sometimes people just want long term. Um, growth assets or some sort of security. Maybe you want some precious metals and your it doesn't throw off income, but it's got a long-term um, you know, value uh, factor. But to really better employ your assets so that they're providing you a return so you're not trading your time for money forever. I don't think anybody really is doing this to compute passive income to their net worth and that's really a great a great exercise can you hear me now yeah we got you chris you thank can. you very much i can i okay i can see you can hear me is my video stopped now yes it's just amazing you know i i unplugged and replugged in my webcam and for some reason now you can't see me but you can hear me so i guess i'll take audio first and then uh, i'll go offline and i'll unplug and plug it in again um i i just you know, I, I love exercises like this and because it always, you know, gives me some tidbit a, a, at the very least of something, a new insight. And I know this sounds so basic, but I had a hard time deciphering between passive and active income. I, I mean, I, I know if you're, look, if you're a W-2, it's it's obvious what's, uh, you know, what's active. And if you got stock, then obviously that's passive. But you know, what really is rental property? I mean, is that passive? Is it active? I mean, everybody says it's passive, but, you know, let me tell you, it's not passive when you've got dozens and dozens of properties. Uh, if you're, you know, shifting income and instead of doing a fix and flip, you know, personally, you have somebody else do it and it's in your 401k, is that active? Is it passive? I, I just don't really have a good answer for you. So um, it was a bit of a struggle. Uh, so I, I just kind of relied on just more of, if it's in my S corp, then it's active, but uh, it, it's just a small insight. I mean, it, the total picture of income, uh, you know, for me, I want to shift more to passive and I have, but it's not sustainable passive, if that makes sense. Um, so for me, it, more of, if you're talking about specific financial freedom is what's the mailbox money, what, what's the stuff that if you totally stopped would be continuous. Um, so that's just, Small, small insight on my part. Yeah, I love that, Chris. I was having the same conversation with Scott last week. I'm like, 
what the heck is passive? <laughs> so this is this is great. I, right. I, really I mean, I don't have a definition of what passive and active, yep. is, but like everything else in life, there's gray and yep. uh, things can't aren't binary. So uh, I I'd love more uh, insight on that. Definitely. And Scott's drawing. So let's go, Scott. Yeah. Give us the insights. <laughs> Okay, cool. So I got a couple of key pieces here too that we picked up from Leah so far as we're just tagging concepts and, and rehashing what we learned last week. One was like this being the most eye-opening factor that we have is what's our passive to net worth, right? So when we looked at crunching down on our um, financial freedom piece here, that was going to be this section. And, like, and that's what the piece that Leah was kicking off for us. It says, hey, once you get down to this number, this is where you go, oh, yuck. Actually, I have a, a huge net worth, but I'm actually don't have this aligned to my passive income. What did we do? What did Leah tag for us of like, what's the common mistake is what they focused on was, uh, was actually this metric that before what she was telling us is everybody focuses on here. How do you become as wealthy as possible? But the freedom actually comes from this number. So it's a misalignment between what everybody else in the world is telling us what's important, but versus what we know is important where it's actually this one step in uh, down the ladder, right? So this is the key insight that I wanted to make sure to underscore for everybody because this is the most common trap. Everybody thinks this is rich, that net worth is rich, but you can actually be poor and have a huge net worth, but meaning you don't have cash flow. Cash flow means not poor, it's I don't have money. Right. I got so this is like a typical scenario that you might see with somebody who owns a business that you go to their business, you say, Hey, how are you doing? You know, with your business, you said, Oh, we're making tons of money. Well, um, where's all your profits? Like, where's all your cash? Because it looks like, bud, you got some holes in your t shirt here. You're driving a 1998 Honda Civic, you know, but you're telling me you're worth $20 million. And so, what happened? He's like, Well, look out in the yard. You see all that equipment that we own? I got bulldozers. I got all kinds of stuff out here. That's my, that's my net worth. And I said, well, what is it that you want? Do you want a bunch of equipment, a high net worth in that business? Or do you want a business that generates tons of passive cash flow for you or cash flow for you to live off of? And the trap that business owners and investors make is by focusing on net worth as the number one objective is that they stop the analysis there and they build net worth, but they don't actually build in the freedom. All right, so just be cognizant of that with your businesses. When you're thinking about how much money you're going to make from something or what's going to happen to your net worth, that you don't end up like the guy who just owns a bunch of equipment because of a bunch of equipment is not freedom. Second piece here too is this question here with um, that Chris had. Chris, did you have a comment on that before we jump uh, to your consideration? Yeah, and I, I almost hesitate to, but just to add a little more flavor, I, 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 I for the most part agree with everything you just said. I mean, and in the analogy used, I, I couldn't agree with you more. But I also think it depends on where somebody's net worth is. If it's all tied up in a business, you're hundred percent, If especially if it's an illiquid one. But I mean, if you go the other extreme and you say somebody who's got 20 million in stock and yet, you know, let's just say it's not really dividend generating uh, and their passive to net worth is, is small, it's still a lot easier to create that, that uh, you know, passive, you, you could still, focus on increasing that net worth in that stock portfolio uh, and borrow against it at a very low interest rate or switch it into dividend investments. I, I guess what I'm just trying to say is it, it really depends on where that net worth is. And if it's in a business the liquid, I agree. 100%, right? I think the purpose of the tool is to just bring awareness to what's current. And then there will be a secondary consideration of, well, I don't necessarily like that. How can I get it more into something that's going to be where I want it to be? And something that's like locked up with like bulldozers and a construction business is a much more difficult asset to convert passive to net than say stock would be, right? 100%. So like 100%. if you were coaching somebody, Chris, that's what I would hear you. That's what I hear you saying. It's like, if I was coaching somebody, that's where I'd want to dig into more details. 100%. If I'm coaching Leah, Leah, is it that you own a bunch of uh, bulldozers, you know, or is it that you have a bunch of, uh, a bunch of stocks? And if you had a bunch of stocks, like what could you do differently to help you convert? Is that, is that, is that fair to say, Chris? hundred percent. Cool. Everything's um, in the nuance. <laughs> everything's in the nuance and the tool as I mind here is that what Chris is modeling for us in this inquiry is the perfect discussion because from what we saw from Leah was, well, I filled out the calculator. Now I have the data points. I'm aware of the pain. And now who can I go find that can help me shift 
the shift what's going on with my members to help me with the pain. And that's what Chris is filling in for us here, which is, well, actually, if you have somebody who's like a coach for you, right? Like Chris is modeling for us here, like what a coach would say is, great, thank you for giving me all the data points, but now I can help you brainstorm how we can get these numbers to shift, all right? And that's where Chris's business experience, investment experience, et cetera, would come into play to be supportive for somebody in Leah's position, potentially, right? Assuming Leah owns a bunch of assets, right? Or whatever those could be, right? And we could dive into that if we had more time today about what that would look like. And, and perhaps we will in the future for you, Leah, as, as if you're willing to be a case study for us, we might be able to go through and rehash it out. I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> well, let's, let's tee that up and see how we can make that a successful exercise because that's really opening the kimono and saying, hey, I really want help. And I'm, I'm going to show you guys what I got because I really want help on what's going to be the collective wisdom of this group. And I know that we would all be very excited to be able to help you. Um, get to that place. Um, so maybe that's something, maybe Gina, maybe that's something just for us to flag there with uh, with uh, helping Leah get prepared for a future session um, on doing a case study around um, her situation. And maybe other people after they see that will be uh, co as courageous as Leah and to coming in and showing everyone. Um, so the other thing that came up for us here too is this question about passive to active. And so what I'd like to be able to do is just introduce the idea here for us guys is that passive and active is actually a continuum, right? That things are more or less passive or active and we're gonna make different moves, right? Like, so what, what things would make like a real estate investment, investment more passive is I would say, well, I have a property manager, right? I have, um, it's a syndication, a syndication deal, right? But we all know that there's going to be like certain elements to this underneath uh, underneath these uh, positions here, or this one could be like a fund, right? Uh, a dividend fund. So let's just think about here, like these are all what we would say, these are the ways that you can make your investments more passive, but will they all still have active components? Sure, I have to vet and hire and oversee uh, my property manager, right? And because I have to vet, hire, and oversee my property manager, that's an active activity, even though I've inter introduced a passive a, a way to make it more passive versus me just doing it individually. My syndication deal, I have to place new investments, right? So that's, that's the active component of any syndication I get to. Eventually, I'm going to get a return of capital. And now I got to find, I have to have deal flow to place a new investment. So that's, even in this investment strategy, I'm still finding that there's an active component to the, what happens with the flow of money. And then passive income, let's say with like a dividend producing fund, right? You say, well, this might be the least, uh, this is like a perpetual, let's just assume for a second, this is a perpetual cash flowing fund to you that pays you out monthly. Well, even in that scenario, even though you'd never have to place a new investment with it, do you still need to oversee it? 100%. You still need to oversee it, right? Are they actually paying you your money each month? right? Are they actually fulfilling on their promises that you're watching your money? Of course. So the idea that there's anything purely passive or active in life is a discussion based upon a continuum that the right question is, what systems and processes and people can I include in my life to help me make this more passive? Systems, processes, and people are going to help me make my money more passive over time, right? And this is where the skill sets upskill of things like Chris, and other people, right, who might be have, have more experience to say, hey, these are the ways in which we've seen best practices of people accumulating wealth and putting in systems, processes, and people that help you make this more passive. And so once you get to that place that you can identify clearly what are the active and passive components of an investment strategy, and you're then you'll say, great, now I can see what are the tactics that I can move this from active to passive, then the next question becomes, how much time are you truly spending? And this would be the question that Chris and somebody in Chris's position will then have to ask himself. They'll say, well, great. How much time am I really willing to put into this investment strategy? And so great. I know that I'm focused on other things that are going on in my family and living an amazing life and going out and being able to contribute to the things that I care about. So what I'm willing to do is I'm going to give 10 hours a week. I'm going to give 10 hours a week as my active component allotment. 
and I'm going to drive what are my systems processes and the people to help hit my 10 hour a week goal. Because I understand that there's going to be a certain amount of active component to everything that I'm doing. I need to pick a number that I feel comfortable with and then drive my tactics to make it more passive until I can hit my hourly weekly goal. Cool. Everybody pick up on that? Following me? Okay, cool. This is a different kind of goal setting. This is like a 301 level of how, what happens with that financial freedom calculator. But I wanted to show you guys since we were hitting up on it. Okay, great. So we got about 20 uh, minutes left for today. Uh, and shifting gears into what are we gonna talk about here uh, today for um, out of our journal and our planner. All right, so everybody open up your uh, journal. You guys got these open up here, looking at page. It looks like here we're at the end, coming into the end of March. So it looks like we're going to start. Let's look at page 50. Cool. Um, so looking at page 50, this is going to say your monthly reflections and planning. If you'll see that on your chart here. Um, and then if you go back to page, uh, page 36, you guys, if you did this exercise, you would have your quarterly goals, monthly goals, your board of directors and your fish is filled out here. And what are your affirmations and visualizations? Yeah. So just for the purposes of what we're talking about, right. For this section of our education, we're just focused here on our top quarterly goals and monthly goals. So when you read through your top quarterly goals and monthly goals that you read out, wrote out earlier, um, how well do you feel like you did on achieving what that monthly goal is that monthly and quarterly goals are. I know we still have a few days left going into it, but do you feel like you're on course or off course of where those monthly and quarterly goals are into it? So next piece would be for us to say, great. I now can see how I'm reviewing. Here's what I did before. This is what I set out to do for this month and this quarter. And now the question becomes as, as well, how well did I, how well did I go about achieving that? And the questions that we have about how well do you go about achieving that is a little bit different than what you might have been used to. What I'm recommending to try is, of course, you're going to see if these things are done or not done, right? We should actually be reviewing that as part of our daily process because that's actually what happens right here. Reviewing your goals, affirmations, and visualizations, right? That's part of your daily to-do is I need to be reviewing my goals, reviewing my affirmations, reviewing my visualizations of getting me into the right activities. But the idea here is that these might, are gonna be either done or not done, and you have a high level awareness of what you're checking off each day. So what's important about the monthly review? In my belief about what's important about the monthly review and what's been proven effective for me is actually a lot around um, keeping the energy moving forward. Looking at quarterly and monthly goals are long enough that it is unlikely that you will ever complete 100%. So what becomes effective about the quarterly and monthly goals is that you're driving towards what an ideal level of accomplishment would look like. And what's important about reviewing your monthly and quarterly goals is not only what's done or not done, but it's also how do you feel about what happened? Because if you can recognize the positive emotional impacts that are happening, then what that does is that carries your energy forward into the next month is by acknowledging these key aspects of it. So I'd like to just take a minute here, guys, as you have your journal open and you're looking out there, is I, wanna, I want us to go through here and just do, what do you want to acknowledge that you're proud of accomplishing this month? When you look at your quarterly goals, and your monthly goals here, what do you, what do you want to acknowledge that you're proud of accomplishing this month? And I'll ask for a couple of shares here. All right, Leah, go ahead. Just to keep the ball rolling, I'll talk again. Um, I touched on at least everything that was in my quarterly goals and one or two things I really completed. Although, you know, kind of the, sometimes with, with a goal like that, the more you start to dig into something, you realize that there's still more to do, even more than maybe you originally considered. But, um, I made progress and on at least everything. So what you're proud of accomplishing this month is making progress on everything. Yeah. It's not making progress. Okay, cool. Connie, what is it for you? What are you proud of accomplishing this month? Yeah, it's something similar. I made significant progress. 
significant progress. And it just wasn't just with my goals. It was with the energy level, the momentum, um, the skills. So I fill out my, I spend my at least half an hour every morning with this little blue book. <laughs> and it's given me sig a significant structure and framework. It helps me start my day. And it's that building that momentum and moving forward. Oh, beautiful. So one thing that like sounds like what you're proud of accomplishing this month is actually get entering into a tool set that helps you create clarity yeah. and focus that you're able to do each day. Yeah. And, and one of my affirmations is I am making progress daily. Mm, there you go. Right. Yeah. Focus originally, daily progress. Yeah. Originally it was like, I am an ultra executor. Um, but I found that to be kind of a punishing affirmation. It, it was like, I felt like I was always falling short of that goal. So I switched it to say, I am making progress daily. And that was something that could give me that acknowledgement and momentum. Yes, I'm, I did this today. I did that today. And it's like you said, it's those small steps. Yep. Daily, yeah. Daily, regular. That's those That's daily it. small steps. Yeah. That come in every day. Uh-huh. So Connie, I'm going to stick with you here on this next one as we come through. Is like, uh -huh. what do you want to acknowledge that you wish could have gone better? What do you want to acknowledge that wish you wish could have gone better? Yeah, that's a good question. And I, I usually what I do is I try to set a goal of, you know, spending those X hours per week, right? So if I spend, uh, if I spend you know, a half an hour a day with my little blue book, uh, then I actually have to execute those tasks, right? It's not enough to just spend time with your blue book and, and feeling like you're making progress and learning the skills. Then you have to practice those skills. So I think I could have been more disciplined about scheduling more actual hands-on, I don't know, task time. So to me, this you know, I've been, I started attending these meetings at the end of January. So, you know, now I have a couple of months to learn, you know, solidify the skills and learn them. So it's the actual task time. I can't be satisfied with just like, like we were talking about in a previous um, session. I love learning, but it's the application that makes the difference, right? The learning should be a leverage, a tool to like a crowbar to I, leverage you. I, I just want to, I want to pop in here, Connie, and uh -huh. just make sure that I'm following here. So what I understand is like, what could have gone better is say, Hey, listen, you know, I got, I'm doing my little book, my LBB process, my little blue uh -huh. book processes here. And what I'm learning is that, well, actually to get effective at the execution that I'm looking for, I actually need to schedule my task. And I need to schedule them at like a time. When am I going to okay. do that thing? Or whatever that task is. And what happened? What do you think is happening because you didn't schedule the time? Well, actually, I made significant progress on that. I think I could have um, been more disciplined to take time away from lower value activities to focus, to give myself more time. So remove those lower value activities. Or so at least also like, it sounds like there's also a piece here too, which is something that I wish could have gone better was how well did I work on prioritization? Like, I think I for me, yeah. I, is, it, is, it, is that the thing? Is it like I'm, I'm, I'm struggling, not struggling necessarily, but it's about like, because when I hear like I'm focusing on lower value activities tells me I'm not really focused on the highest priority activities. For me, it's about discipline. I have to have the discipline to schedule, to schedule those important, but not urgent, right? Okay. Schedule those important, but not urgent. So I have them listed. I have the important but not urgent listed, but now I have to schedule the time for those and not let the tyranny of the urgent, right, take over my day. So, because you're 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 okay doing the important and urgent, you're getting whipped, but it probably what it feels like is you're getting whipped around by the important and urgent. Everything can feel urgent, and I'm not really getting to the important but not urgent things that need that need to have progress. I am actually making progress, but I feel like I could make more. Make more progress. It would help you be more. Make more. And yes. I, heard you, I heard you use this important, but not urgent, which actually tells me that what you're probably doing over here is you're doing your Eisenhower box to some yes, degree. Yes, I am. Yeah, absolutely. Because you're saying like, cool, I got this category. I'm okay here, but it's this category is where I need to start scheduling. 
And that's where I can do it. If I scheduled these tasks that I got from my Eisenhower box here, then I'd say, hey, that's what that's what I could go do better coming yeah. in this next month, in this next yeah. quarter. Okay, cool. Um, so Connie, let's just stick with you here um, because we're a little short on time today. So I hope you don't mind being the- No, no, I'm always the good kid, right? I'm happy with it. It's helpful. <laughs> Excellent. So let's go ahead and talk through the top highlights then, right? So now what we've done so far as we've said, cool, what are you proud of accomplishing this month, right? This is where you give yourself that pat on the back of like, hey, you know, despite all the other things that I wish that I was better about, this is the thing that I'm going to say, I'm, I was good at this. This is something I can say, hey, man, I can give myself a pat on the back as because I did this thing. Now when it says, hey, what do you wish could have gone better? This is the question of, of, of saying, this is your critique of our process. Of where do we learn where our process could be improved as it relates to Connie? Right. We have a generalized process, but this is where Connie is finding at. This is the, the real leverage point that I need to focus on as where things could have gone better. And then back into the top highlights of the month is this is a place where we would say, great, um, this is where I was most proud. But like, what's a highlight? What's something I would hang my hat on? And when I reviewed at the end of, um, you know, if I reviewed all of my top highlights at the end of the year, these are the takeaways that I'd say, how was this month or this quarter successful? Because I'm going to review this at the end of the year and say, man, when I kick ass this year, I'm going to go back through here and review my top highlights to remember like, hey, you didn't, you didn't do almost nothing this year. Look, you did all of these amazing things. Look at all these amazing things I did this year. So what are those top highlights that you're going to carry forward with you, Connie, um, into the succeeding, succeeding months that way you have something to review? Um, and I think here it's what you, getting back to what you said before. What systems, processes, and people will help me move towards my ideal life? And to me, the little blue book is a significant, um, has systems and processes around it, learning and getting a chance to practice having the structure that will lead me towards any goal that I want to accomplish in life. Well, so for you, the highlight is, I'm feeling stoked about the fact that I'm getting into a system and process that feels to be working for me and that I'm practicing the structure. I don't claim to be perfect on it, yep. but I'm practicing the structure. And I believe that this is a top highlight for me because if I do this structure, I can have anything I want. Anything exactly. I want in life is going to be easier for me to accomplish. Exactly. Cool. And then, so looking and coming into this next question, what areas do you need the most support? Um, well, again, this was where the things that I want to accomplish, including what I call building my castle, I have parts of my castle, which is my asset protection and estate built, um, but I need help pulling up the drawbridge, right? So that when I contacted Randy and he talked to me through what things still need to be done. And I have, I'm getting an appointment with one of your lawyers next week to help me refine what I already have in place. And so that's an area where I needed the most support and I think I'm getting it. So what's after that? It's again, I looked at this net worth versus active cash flow. Like <clears throat> Leah, it was, a, it was a revelation. I've always focused on net worth, but now I, I need that help to move towards more passive cash flow. Well, so here we have, it looks like it says we have the asset protection estate planning. Here you're looking to engage a professional service, happen to choose Royal Legal Solutions to do that, which have, uh, I, I'm just going to go out and say it. Like, I think that's a great decision. Uh, if uh, you don't mind me tooting the own horn there. Um, but then also looking at our net worth to passive is like, here's another area where I need some, uh, some additional support coming into it. Um, and what, who, what are the things that are coming forward for you today or present in mind for you today, Connie, about here is who can support you to achieve your goals coming in the next month? Um, we, this one looks pretty clear. So why don't we focus on this one, this net worth to passive. So who can help you move towards or help you to achieve supporting you in achieving that goal coming in the next month? We know we're not going to get all the way there in the next month, but like those steps that you're talking about, who do you have? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. And this is where, you know, uh, again, I might, uh, I might ask if, you know, the Royal Legal Group of Companies has some things to explore. I did attend the um, March 23rd, you know, Royal Investing Group, where they were talking about notes. 
investing in notes. I actually thought that sounded pretty interesting. So, you know, that was the cash flow check. So this would be notes, this would be a page. Mm -hmm. sort of the cash flow check. Yeah. And then who else guys, who else could, um, is clear for us for like what Connie, where else Connie could have support, whether she chooses to use utilize it or not is another thing, but where, what other sources could Connie pull for support with looking at this net worth to passive issue and helping drive towards being more passive? Where else could Connie get support? And, you know, likely from this group, right? Yeah. The Royal Life Group, right? Discord and stuff. Over there in Discord. So when we look at this net worth, the passive piece, just to take one second to break this out, this works like a where everything works for us, right? There's an awareness tool, and then there's also like an action tool. So the most baseline awareness tool that we have is that financial freedom calculator, right? That, that key drop here to say, hey, my net worth of passive is off, right? Then there's a whole nother consideration that comes into here, which is what's my productivity of my assets? And this is where you actually have to start looking at, well, how are my individual assets performing? How, is, how are those properties actually cash flowing? What is going to be my true cap rates and passive passive income that's coming off of each one of my investments, right? So that's another awareness tool that usually takes some type of um, accounting CPA slash CFO type thinking, right? Not complicated, right? It's not at your level of it. It's not going to be like you're trying to run Royal Legal Solutions, right? And all of the in-depth financials that, that Gina and Pete run through and on keeping our organization going and the, and the investments that we have there. But something in here that says, hey, well, I really need to understand what's better happening with my investments because you need to make a decision on saying like, is it notes? Is it a fund? Is it new syndication investments? to know what is gonna be the impactful action steps after I can find out how the individual assets in my portfolio are performing. Yeah? Does that make sense, Connie? Absolutely. Yeah. So this piece where we start to break down the um, productivity of the assets is something that Pete does as part of when we're looking at all of the tax strategy. So the way that tax strategy works, and I'll just take two seconds to go talk through this real quick because this is really important for everybody to understand. So everybody that comes in from Royal Legal Solutions that says, hey, I want tax strategy because I feel like I'm overpaying for my tax, right? And my first question that I always ask for is, you guys aren't gonna be surprised by this, but you should hear the other people on the other end of the phone. What do you want? They'll say, well, I wanna minimize taxes. Right? I say, great, what is minimized taxes gonna get you? And then I get a blank stare. I say, well, I have more money. I'm just like, well, what, what kind of money do you got? They're like, what do you mean what kind of money? Because minimizing taxes can go in two different routes. You can use retirement accounts, right? And when you use retirement accounts, what do you do? Your net worth is gonna increase, but your cash flow decreases right? Versus doing something, something different, right? That there's all other types of strategies that you could do here that would say, great, maybe my net worth is actually going to be less than normal, or but my cash flow will be up. And then the question becomes, what do you care about? What type of income, what financial metric are you try, really trying to influence? Because there's three key financial metrics. There's your net worth, your cash flow, and then your taxable income. So you, people will say, what do you want? They say, I want to minimize taxes. So I say, great, are we focused on this? Well, I can drive this number super far down. Your net worth is going to increase, but your cash flow is going to plummet. Is that what you really want? No, that's not what I really want. I'm after financial freedom from my investing. Great. So you're really looking for a strategy that's going to minimize your taxes, but maybe it can make sense to pay more in taxes, even if you had a lesser net worth, if it was able to increase your cash flow and help make you more passive. Right? Maybe there's another secret value here, which is time, which would be important to somebody like Chris, right? 
actually, I'm okay on these numbers. What I really want to know is how can all of this be done in such a way that I minimize my time? What kind of relationships can I leverage into that will hit the financial impacts that I'm looking for and give me time back? These are the types of complex questions that come in from meeting with Pete and myself as part of the Royal Legal Team that we start to chunk through, which is helping you get super clear on what do I want? Because once you're super clear on what do you want, what, what do you think happens? You start to pull in the relationships. You start to have a high level of clarity of what do you need to learn? That's gonna help you get to where you wanna go. Hey, Scott, I wanna do a time check for you to be okay. mindful. Okay, all right. All right, so uh, we'll, so, uh, let me go ahead and bounce from here, guys, into it. But I want to go ahead and just walk through just as the very end of it here is we had a great process. We talked through about how do we want to, um, what we were proud of accomplishing this month. Then we talked through what you wish you could have gone better. So these turns into like specific changes inside of like the process that we're using and looked for how were we currently making decisions using the Eisenhower box and prioritization. Then we also talked about today is like, what are gonna be our top highlights, the things that we can feel really good about accomplishing this month, which was for Connie, which was practicing getting into a new structure of awareness and execution. And we talked about as well as like, what's gonna be most important for you to go into next month and then who can help you support that. And when you turn the page, you'll see that now you're gonna be here for quarter two is your next set of quarterly goals, monthly goals. So what you found here and what you discovered by doing this process will drive forward into page 52 to help you set up what's this next month and this month, this quarter gonna be for me coming up. Thank you guys so much. I hope you have a fantastic day. I'll leave it to you, Gina. Yep, thanks, thanks Scott. Okay, so, um... Wow, Connie, thank you for sharing all of that uh, that you shared and being very uh, diligent in using your planner. That's definitely inspiring. I I'm not going to tell you that I'm using it as religiously as you. Chris, you wanted to share something, please? I, I wanted you to finish your thought first. And if you've got a, a structure you want to go for. No, go for it. Go for it. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wanted to make a couple of comments because uh, one of the other insights I had about this financial freedom worksheet that um, I, I don't think it gets enough attention and it's not always an easy thing to talk about, but um, I find that so many people just spend way too much money. <laughs> and if you want to increase your cash flow, one of the best ways to do that is delayed gratification, is to realize that you have an end goal of being financially free. And what that takes is not buying everything under the sun. Um, and it can be very difficult to have that conversation with yourself and to live that lifestyle. You know, especially, you know, the more money you make, it's it's called the hedonistic treadmill. The more money you make, the more you want to spend. Bigger house, a bigger boat, bigger everything. Uh, and, you know, it's uh, keeping up with the Joneses. And, and I've grown up in Southern California my whole life. And, you know, when I was building, you know, my net worth, I was teased by a lot of friends. I remember my first house that I purchased when I was in my 20s. I kid you not, the loan officer looked at me and said, why don't you drive a better car? You know, I, my car worked great. And you know what? I was focused on building my wealth. Uh, and if you can really focus on reducing your expenses, um, it can certainly increase your cash flow. If I can make one other additional point um, is... I have a slightly differing opinion uh, of, of Scott in terms of focusing on increasing your net worth. I, I think if you can get your expenses down and you can get to a point of, of either active or passive cash flow to where you can pay for those expenses, I'm a believer that everything else should go toward building your net worth. You, you know, if you do that and you focus on it and you really reduce your taxes and your tax burden, you know, later on, you can take that net worth, assuming you're not investing in things that are completely illiquid. Um, you can create that passive cash flow later to replace your active income. Uh, and I'll give a really quick example. There's a lot of focus now on people that want to be financially free by investing in dividend stocks. And when you look historically over time, dividend stocks do not perform as well as your average S&P 500 stock. So if you invested all your money, in, and it's being an exaggeration, in a dividend stock portfolio, or you invested all your money in a, an S&P 500 portfolio, yeah, you would have more cash flow with the dividend stock portfolio, but you would have higher risk, 
and you will have a higher or lower net worth after let's just give a given time of 10 or 20 years. Um, so which was better for you? Well, I would argue the dividend income is now taxable income. If you could increase that stock portfolio, or, or we could even use other investments, I'm just using that as an example, and increase your net worth, well, then later on, you could then change that to, you know, the net worth is now high enough where that uh, smaller dividend is, is good enough for you. You can borrow against your portfolio. Uh, you can do what I did when I had my first deals. I, I borrowed against my stock portfolio to buy my first uh, real estate deal. Um, so I, I just don't want to poo-poo building net worth or uh, reducing your expenses. Because reducing your expenses, uh, and I'm not saying don't live life, enjoy life, enjoy moments, create moments, but physical objects aren't going to make you any more happier. Uh, and if you can focus on that, uh, and uh, you know, you're going to, you're going to succeed, increase that cash flow. Yep. I agree. Um, I think it's, I think it was what Scott was kind of getting into. It's really being clear on what it is that you want what are you trying to achieve in life what is your you know comfort like art do you really think you're going to get fulfilled with all that stuff right I mean gracious about about once every couple of months I go and I'm like why why do I have all this stuff in this closet I promised myself I wouldn't buy this stuff what happened stop it um so yeah it, it really it's 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 about being mindful um and being very intentional about what it is that you want um, and what does financial freedom mean? That's different for everybody, right? Um, Leah, you wanted to add something? I think we've also been trained or, it's, you know, maybe it's part of the uh, housing and mortgage industry to encourage people to obsess over the value of their house. Their house is an asset. And the truth is your house is like a money pit that never puts money in your pocket. It's only taking money out of your pocket, which isn't to say that it's a great still of value and it does increase and you live there, whatever. But when I think of you now people who are obsessed with the most expensive house, they're maxed out on the mortgage. They have no room anywhere and talk about an illiquid asset. You live in it um, and you're paying every expense you could come up with, you know, all the expenses related to that. So it's an asset and it's not an, it's not an income producing asset. That's for sure. So, um, you know, that's something that I think has had gotten a lot of focus before, and now people are sort of maybe taking a second look at, you know, wow, do I have so much of my net worth in this home that then is just a money pit? Yep, <laughs> yep. absolutely. Connie, were you going to add something, or are you just still off mute from before? Uh, I just wanted to say my mother used to call those people that had uh, extravagant exteriors, all hat and no paddle. And she was a real estate investor. And, you know, by the grace of God, she left me a little something to get started in my life. But, you know, we were very frugal growing up. And I'm so glad I had that training. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, anyone else that's on the call have any insights from doing the financial freedom calculator? that they want to share. Okay. I want to, um, why y'all are, let me just look, I'm going to look and see what our, what we're doing next week. So, um, I think next week we're going to start to shift gears. We are going to continue for another 13 weeks. So, um, because we're going to start the cycle all over again, but this next 13 weeks, uh, we're going to start, uh, working together and uh, likely we'll, we'll not record these over the next few weeks, or if we record them, we're only just going to record them for the group that's here. Um, because we're really going to start getting into the underneath, right? I mean, we've just barely talked about the surface of the process and some of the stuff, Connie, that you were talking about, we're still going to continue to work on the planner and still work on the process, but now we're going to go to the next level deeper that says, okay, well, let's start looking at what, what does financial freedom mean to you? What are all the like limiting beliefs that we have around, is it even possible to be financially free? Because we can do all this stuff. Like this stuff is like good stuff in the book. Like it's tactical. But if you don't really get underneath the like thinking and feeling and limiting beliefs and all the stuff that comes with it that we all have, 
you can do this planner all day long and it's just an exercise and you may or may not ever, and you'll find yourself frustrated, which I used to do. I'd have all these goals. I'm like, oh man, why am I not accomplishing any, any of them? Because I was trying to do tactics and I wasn't getting underneath what's stopping me from doing the things, right? Um, I wasn't getting honest with myself. So it's going to be a lot of um, sharing of tips and tricks and things like uh that Scott and I have done that I'm still working on. This isn't a one and done. This is a continual process because I feel like every time I find something that's stopping me, once I kind of move and work through that, I find something else. So like this is gonna be a fun ride. Um, and it's intended to help us really get even more real with ourselves. Most of us have already been that way. You've, you've all been very transparent. Um, but if we really wanna get there, then are we really, open to doing the transformational work, the stuff, the soft stuff that people don't like to talk about a lot in business. Uh, but we're really going to get more into that. Chris, were you going to share something? <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, I, I just want to say one, I, I really appreciate and think that's an excellent idea. There, there's things that I'd like to share, but um, I, none of it's recorded and shared into the public. Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, half the no. reason us are with Royal Legals, we want to protect our anonymity and for sure. Uh, I start talking numbers and uh, oh yeah, no, we're, we're not gonna, gonna this next lawsuit. round. I yeah, yeah, this next round we're not gonna. Uh, I'm probably I'm not gonna even record it. So the challenge will be we're not gonna record this next one because it is gonna get sensitive and we do want people to feel comfortable. And I recognize you have other people on this call and nobody has to give like all their numbers or all their specifics. You can use generalities, but we're not going to record it to us. The next, this next batch is for us all grow together and I get it. Uh, so we're really not going to be uh, recording it. I, I appreciate that. And, and uh, I, I also, you, what you just said really struck with me too, uh, a couple minutes ago about what it means to be financially free. Um, you know, for, for me, uh, I, I feel a sense that I, I am financially free and I, I work because I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. um, but I also work because I've seen people who have stopped and they lose their purpose. It's tied to their ego. And, and I, I don't even mean that in a bad way. I mean, if you've got <laughs> fabulous hobbies and you can keep your mind busy, um, by all means. Um, but I've had family members that I watch just die slowly because you know, they had enough money to live financially free, but they were just bored as could be and couldn't fill it with things that they enjoyed. Um, exactly. So, yeah. Continue. Yeah. Because financial free is you have the choice to continue. choice. It's the choice. And that's, and it's really getting to that. It's really understanding that because um, I mean, I've said, I'll, if, as long as my body uh, is, is willing and capable, <laughs> I'll plan to contribute and do some sort of work my entire life because that I believe I was put here for a purpose and it's not to sit around and do nothing. So <laughs> I'll be doing something like that. Um, and I think each of us have that. So we'll, we'll really yeah. get into some of that kind of stuff. And, and um, I, I will, I will flip what you said and, and just say, uh, I'm not, I don't, I don't know if I'm necessarily here for a purpose, but it is my job to create that purpose. And what drives us every day into the next is that constant search. Uh, yeah. and, uh, that, that, that's what drives me. Yeah. Is that constant search, that constant improvement, being the consummate student for the rest of your life. I will never know everything. Sure. Never. <laughs> and when I think I do, I get uh, I get something sent to me to show me I don't know everything <laughs> in ways that I really would prefer not to learn. But, yeah. you know, hey, <laughs> um, any questions? So, yeah, next uh, next week. I can't remember if we end next week. Um, no, it would start, it would start the first, the next 13 weeks starts next week. I'm pretty sure. So if you have some wrap up stuff that we would like to cover, um, and again, we'll be going through some of these tactics in the planner. Um, but really our first discussion is going to start with, let's do, let's do this week wrap up of doing your month in recap and your planning for the next month quarter, right? Um, and then next week we'll start the discussions on, uh, what does it mean to be financially free and start getting to those, um, those limiting beliefs. Everybody good? Awesome. Um, and, uh, I'll work with Scott and let him know we are not going to record because we do desire this, this next round to get, to get, uh, to get very, uh, we're going to dig in. We're going to do a lot more coaching. <laughs> so, uh, and I know it's tough. But I'm, I am very grateful to all of you that did share. 
um, and we're as transparent as you felt comfortable. The intention is what we're doing right now, and Ken has been helping us, is taking snippets from this, but not just trying to take the teaching. We're, tr- we're working as much as we can to protect any of that stuff. Most of this stuff is getting posted right now, but our intention is um, to uh, pull it, uh, not pull it, but to create a program just of the planner itself. Um, but your stuff won't be in it as much as we can. We're trying to figure that one out right now. Um, yep. And so Liz, you know, anybody can still join us, but it is going to be um, not recorded and we're going to get into that next round of planning for the next quarter. Definitely. All right. So that means you have to show up because you're not going to have a recording. <laughs> so, all right. Thanks, everybody. We appreciate you all being here.